All right, we're in part two of our study in Romans chapter seven, and that is the title of this message, Romans seven is not the Christian struggle. So we've already shown beyond any shadow of a doubt that Romans seven is not referring to the Christian struggle. It is Paul speaking of what Israel is under law seeking to be justified by works. That's the whole tenor and context and theme of Romans chapters one through 11. It is showing the contrast between the Old and New Covenant and the contrast of those who would believe that they were justified by works versus those who believe that they are justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ. So now we're going to start with Romans chapter 7. Do you not know, or do you not know, starts off, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. And he's speaking about the old man here. For the married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he is living. And that's Israel, and of course, as individuals, but that's Israel under their old man. Just as Christ is the singular old man that's ruling over the new covenant creation, so also the old man, singular, was ruling over the old covenant creation. And as long as they were seeking to be justified by works, that old man was dead. Now, certainly we had believers under the Old Testament, and they weren't trusting in their works, but Christ had not performed his sacrifice, and without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So all of them under the Old Testament were still dead in sins, but they had faith, and it was accounted or laid to their account for righteousness, which would later be given to them through the finished work of Christ. So if the married woman, the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, that's the old man, she is released from the law concerning her husband. That is, she is free from the law of sin and death. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. And there is your old and new wineskins of which Christ spoke. If you try to put new wine in old wineskins, the old bursts forth and the wine just drips out. Okay, so that's what Jesus is talking about. And Paul, contrary to liberal opinion, uh, Paul is not speaking a new theology. He is speaking everything that he read in the prophets, and he is certainly echoing the theology of his Lord Jesus. So it says, um, if she's, she shall be called an adulteress, but if her husband dies, that's the old man, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she be joined to another man. That's Jesus. So there's the old man, and then there's the new man, Christ Jesus. And the Bible says throughout Colossians and Ephesians, uh, we have been made under a new man or married or put on a new man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law. Excuse me through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another. So it is through Christ. Christ was the first to die to that. And now we are joined to him. Okay, now that first took place through Israel and then for all those who have faith. And in case you're wondering, you know, how does this work? You know, we were never under law. The law was given to show what happens to the human heart when the law is given to it. The law was added because of transgression. In other words, transgression was already there, but the law was added to reveal it. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And we'll see later on, you know, when the commandment came, sin revived. So sin was already there. It's there in every human heart, but it has to be revived to show sin exceedingly sinful. And that's what God did through Israel. It's not saying that they were the only ones with depraved hearts at all. Not at all. It's just that God used them as a test, a testing ground to show what the law does when given to the human heart. The law shows sin. And what does humanity, nat the natural human heart do when given law? It uses that to try and justify itself. Yet Galatians is very clear. The law was our taskmaster, Paul says to the Jewish Christians, to lead, or schoolmaster, to lead us to Christ. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die through the law, uh, to the law, through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. That's Jesus. So that we might bear fruit to God. Once you're a new creation, you bear fruit. It's an inevitable fruit that takes place. Some people are wondering, well, what's that fruit? What's that fruit? We'll get to that. 
It's, it's, it's definitely not a list of do's and don'ts, a list of what to abstain from and what you, and, and what you can partake in. It's not that. You see, that was, that was law. Thou shalt not, thou shalt. Tree of life, right? Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Other trees. It says, of any tree you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. And that's all, all that's referring to is the law. Do not eat. Do not trust in the law. And then what do they do when they trust in it or eat from it? They try to cover themselves with a fig leaf. Isaiah 59, they cover themselves with their works. So as sin just leads to self-righteousness, and that's what happens with law. Law brings about sin, and it breeds self-righteousness in the human heart. That's why we acknowledge that we're depraved. <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens. When we're given law, even though God said, obey all these things and you'll live. That's true. If they could be all, all, obey all of them perfectly, they would live. Galatians says, cursed is the one who does not continue in all of the things of the law to do them. Well, Jesus did continue in those things and therefore he was the lamb without spot, without blemish, the lion who was worthy to open the seals and he was worthy to be an eternal sacrifice that conquered death, hell, and the grave, and sin, okay? All right, for while we were in the flesh, so he's speaking of this as if it's past, when we were in the flesh, and later on he says, basically he's speaking of himself, so under law, I am in the flesh, I am carnal, sold under sin is what he's saying. So he says, when we were in the flesh, it's not true anymore, we're not in flesh, we're not carnal, we're not sold to sin. We always think of carnal as, you know, well, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not drinking, I'm not smoking, I'm not ratting my hair. No, that, that, that has nothing to do with carnality. In the flesh is speaking about pursuing justification by the works of the flesh. That's why Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. Whether it's nationality or your will or your works profits nothing. Who were born, not of the will of the flesh nor the will of man nor of blood, he says, and born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law. That's what the law does. It brings out the beast. <laughs> it shows the beast. It reveals the beast that's in us. Humans. Humans. Humanity. It reveals the human heart. Don't try and save yourself by the law. All it does is reveal the wickedness of our human hearts. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. So if while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body, everyone, that is in the members of everyone, all, everyone within that Old Testament law, the uh, uh, Old Testament, Old Covenant system, that's what the law did. It aroused sin. It showed sin. It showed the vileness of the human heart. That sin might become what? Exceedingly sinful, as Paul says later on. We'll get to that. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to what? Bear fruit unto death. So that's the fruit. It's a positional death. Okay? That, all of those things, all of those things, sin and attempts to justify the human heart before God, by the works of the flesh, that's all fruit. All right? But now we have been released from the law. So Paul even says it there. We're released. Later he says, I'm sold under sin. I'm carnal. I'm fleshly. I'm of the flesh. I'm in the flesh. He's speaking of himself when he was under law. So he describes it that way. As an Israelite under law, I, we, together, the community, we are carnal, sold under sin. But when we're in Christ, what? We're released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound. They died, their old man died, so that we would serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Compare this with 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that letter versus spirit contrast. Very important. Romans 7 2 Corinthians 3, Galatians 5. We're dealing with position before God. So that we would serve in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. There are lots of people today who like to argue, well, we, everyone knows what's right and wrong. No, we don't. That's how depraved we are. 
Talk about total depravity. I marvel at some of these guys who, you know, believe in, so I believe in sovereign grace, obviously. I believe in the sovereignty of God. But I marvel that so many of these, these men and women who profess Calvinism, who profess to believe in sovereign grace, who profess to believe in total depravity, will still say that we can come to know sin without the law. As if just some, by natural revelation, we can know we're brute beasts. It takes God to even reveal that to the human heart. To even reveal that there's something wrong, we're disobeying, okay? We're going to continue reading this in our next segment in Romans chapter 7.